Yo, this episode of Bass Freaks is brought to you by Dunlop Super Bright Bass Strings. Dunlop Super Bright Bass Strings put your sound front and center with a bright yet musical top end, balanced fundamental, and a warm low end. Designed from the ground up to fit the vision of what a string should be, Super Bright Bass Strings provide a superior response that allows the natural voice of your bass to come through. Made in California at Dunlop headquarters, go to jimdunlop.com and check out Super Bright Bass Strings. What's up, my friends? Welcome to Dunlop Presents Bass Freaks. This is a place for all of us bass freaks to chat it up, gain a little insight and inspiration, and have some fun with some great bass players. I'm your host, Josh Paul, and today we have the very cool Ian Martin Allison on the show. What's up, dude? Oh, dude, cheers. I'm such a fan of you. Let me let me just... No, no, no. I'm a fan oh. of you. No, no. <laughs> I just have to start by saying, like, whenever you put a video up, I have, like, a thousand questions. I'm like, okay. How? <laughs> what? Where? Why? When? Like, oh, dude, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. So, man, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, man. And, and uh, really, I got to say the same thing about you. You so eloquently... Um, speak your mind when when talking about the passion of the bass that you have and i'm a fan dude thank you thanks very much it took me a long time to get comfortable enough with myself i guess to mm-hmm. like feel like i was able to do that or maybe even had permission to do that so i i appreciate you saying that man it's it's taken me a while you seem extremely comfortable and uh relatable as well and Going back to the videos that you were just referencing from my stuff, if you only knew how really uh, simple-minded I am when it comes to that, so you'd be your mind would be blown, man. It's just, oh, let's but just that, do this. That, let's just do makes, this. <laughs> that makes me even more upset. That just that makes <laughs> that makes it seem like, like, dude, it's all you. It's like your bones, man. You're like your tissue, your sinew, your brain. And like I was hoping you'd be like, well, yes, my uh, my plug-in <laughs> chain is is fifty. 50 plugins deep and uh and you're like no nah, man you're, you're telling me like yeah plug into this box and plug into my interface and just like dope shit comes out dude, and it's killing I, me dude. I, I don't know if it's dope but i do just basically <laughs> plug in all right well let's oh let's try this <laughs> that's about it honestly just killing man. man so fun to hear you dude let's i want to talk about your uh journey into the world of bass and really music so sure so let's go from the beginning. When did you start playing? <laughs> um, yeah, man. I mean, I came to the When did you get like, out of so, diapers? Yeah, first. yeah, yeah, right. I, I mean, I came to the instrument like so many people. I tell this story and I'll make it brief, but I had the ball. I was I was tall in the seventh grade. And How I was tall are you now? Just, just, I'm, I'm 6'3", and oh. I was like 6'1", in the seventh grade. Oh, my God. And so I had the ball, right, and I'm the center, and I was like posting up to take a shot. And, getting, and I was really bad. I was bad at basketball, but I was just tall. So they were like, you're on the team right so i've got the ball posted up took a shot missed my whole family's in town dude they're up in the stands they're watching the game i get the rebound which is also like super rare i shoot again i miss a second time i get the rebound again it was easier this time to get it and i took a third shot miss three times the crowd is like screaming i think they're being like yeah ian you're killing it go and i took a third shot missed player from the other team grabs it lays it up into the hoop i'm shooting at and nudges me and goes hey thanks and i was shooting (laughs) at the wrong basket the entire time dude i look up into the stands and my my family is all just like heads down eyes over their you know or hands over their eyes just like mortified to to be my family and it was that day in the seventh grade when i told my mom i i can't do sports and she said, well, well, you got to do something. You can't just play video games. And I said, oh, you know, and there was a band, right? And and they had a drummer and a guitar player. And I was like, maybe I could play the bass. And so that that began this journey. I mean, I'd never played a single instrument before that. I was like the tall, awkward kid, um, not popular, you know, and just like video gamer, like nerd. And I mean, <laughs> the popularity didn't really increase when I got the bass. It's just like, it gave me a lane, you know? It gave me a lane, dude. Like I was so, I grew up in Montana, this little town called Kalispell. Um, there wasn't much of any kind of music scene there. And it just, 
man, it gave me just this lane and focus and identity. And I started to really get into it. I mean, probably like you just voraciously read Bass Player Magazine, you know, tried to go see anybody that I could that was close. My mom ended up taking me to a jazz festival every year in Moscow, Idaho. I met some players there. I studied a little bit with Brian Bromberg. Do you know Brian? Yeah, I do. I remember He's such a killing player and he was real sweet to me. And, you know, um, and then uh, I was I was in a rock band that my buddies in this little town in Montana, we ended up moving to Minneapolis to play music. And that's how I came to Minneapolis. I'm still here uh, making music. I went to college, but really music was my entire focus that time. So then after school, I mean, it was like, you know, trying to make it in the band. And then when that didn't happen, it was started the sideman career. And that brought me, you know, through a bunch of twists and turns and bumps and whirls. Who, what was your first I am. Um, quote unquote pro gig? Dude, my first, okay, my first pro gig was with Lori Line, who is a, who's a piano player in the Midwest. It's all instrumental music. And most of that was on Upright Dude. And I am such a dismal Upright player, but she liked, she hired me because she believed in me. She actually did this thing with her hands when she hired me. She said, right now, your, your attitude is up here. And she put her hand really high and she's like, and your talent is down here. <laughs> she put her hand really low. Wow. You know, she, wow. like, you said, you said, uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, dude, exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh all, man. all right. She's like, you know, but you're going to, but you're going to be with these great players. And really it was, it was an amazing band. Um, Kenny Holman, who, who's a sax player who plays with Corey Wong now was in that band and kind of took me under his wing and, you know, was real sweet to me. I mean, I, I have been very fortunate to be around some really great uh, teachers, gurus, sort of mentors um, in this business that have really helped kind of open some doors for me. Just tried really hard uh, and I played played a lot of upright on that gig. Uh, but then, you know, after that, I, I started to really dig into the stuff I loved, which is rock and roll, funk music, electronic music, uh, and and started to lean into those directions and got some other gigs maybe in, in that zone. But man, that first gig, you know, it was like costume changes, dude. It was like a holiday oh, wow. show. Wow. So we do costume changes and it was mostly upright. It was so out of my element. I was in my, you know, probably mid twenties, but check this out, Josh. I tell a lot of people this, man, I didn't get my first gig that I was really proud of. Like, whereas the Lori line gig was really good for me. I wasn't proud of the music that I was making. It wasn't something that I was passionate about. But I didn't get my first like real gig gig uh, until I was 36 years old with Eric Hutchinson. And I played a lot um, in town uh, in Minneapolis with a bunch of different artists. But in terms of like a touring national gig, I started to play with Eric when I was 36. And so like anybody listening to this who wonders like, dude, I just had this guy hit me in the DMs of like, he was like, man, I'm freaking out, dude. I'm feeling I'm too old for this. I'm having a, I'm freaking out. I'm like, how, how old are you? He's like, I'm 29, bro. He's like, I'm about to be 30. I was like, you're a dick. (laughs) You know, like, man, I didn't get my first real at bat until I was 36. Um, I'm 43 now. I feel like things are just like starting, you know, I really feel that. So, um, I just, wake up really with like gratitude every day to be in this game, uh, to have another chance to play, uh, doing sessions involved at SBL, um, doing stuff with Dunlop. I mean, you know, I, I'm really, really thrilled to be doing what I'm doing and it's, it's taken a long time to get here, man, but, uh, I don't, I don't regret any moment of it. Right. That is the right attitude to have. And you know, (laughs) um, I correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, I don't think that you would be doing all this stuff if you hadn't gone through the journey of going to school, going, playing these other gigs around town and having those learning experiences. Do you agree? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, it's all, it's all just a culmination of all the stuff you've done, right? It's like, you can't, you can't get to point C if you haven't went through point B, right? right? I mean, and, and I really am grateful. I just look at all of the things that I've done and the people that I've been in contact with, whether I'm still making music with them or not Mm -hmm. as just really important kind of guideposts along the way. Um, and so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the journey. It wouldn't, wouldn't change anything about it. Are you going to make some of your own music? Oh yeah. That's like the, have you been been doing that or, or I mean, right. 
I wish I could say, yeah, man, I've got three records. They're just in the hopper ready to come out. It's kind of that thing of like, you know, if you're a carpenter or you're a handyman, you know, like everybody else, everybody else's house looks great, but yours looks like crap. <laughs> you, know, you know, I've been a <laughs> side man for so long, you know, I mean, so uh, and, and it's a terrible excuse. It's I love pouring my creativity into other people's projects. I'm I feel like I I love doing sessions. I love being in the studio. I love doing stuff from home. It's my favorite thing in the world to do. And I'm lucky to get to do it with a bunch of amazing artists. But then I find that I have procrastination around doing my own thing. Uh, that said, I, you know, I took a job last year with Scott's Bass Lessons and man, he's been talking about doing a label and that's getting me fired up to maybe, to maybe make some music. Uh, Amazing. I have, yeah, I have some ideas for sure. Um, and then when, it, dude, honestly, man, whenever I hear you post something, I'm like, oh, what what it does, Josh, is it makes me it makes me so fired up to make my own music. Like awesome. hearing your thing, I'm like, awesome, dang, man. dude, I, uh, I've gotta I've gotta prioritize the time. That's what it is for me. I need to prioritize the time to work on it because right now I'm making gear videos and I'm doing, you know, and I love all that stuff too, man. I love it. Making videos for SBL, tons of content. You're, yeah. I, I, to, I, I have to say you, yeah. you do that extremely, extremely well. I mean, oh, I cheers. love because you're, you're explaining things. Um, so perfectly simple for oh, and you, that anyone can understand and you're keeping it, your energy is so up there that you're keeping it interesting. And, oh, and thanks, aside man. from obviously being a badass player, um, you're making it very interesting. So kudos. Thank you, dude. I, yeah. I think I have, like, I think that education is my heart. Like I, I taught bass at a college in Minneapolis for about 10 years, really enjoyed that time in my life. Um, and then I, then I got more playing opportunity and wasn't in the teaching zone and, and doing the SBL thing kind of allowed me to come back into that zone in a really meaningful way. I love Scott. I really believe in what he's doing. And so, yeah, man, I think about that stuff. Like when I think about techniques or think about, oh, pedals and stuff, I, I'm thinking about them in terms of how could I explain this to the community or if anybody cares, <laughs> you know, like how would I talk about this to somebody who maybe doesn't know how to use a compressor or maybe, you know, doesn't know how to set up an effects chain. Mm -hmm. I find that like I get a lot out of seeing a concept land with someone and them getting value out of it versus me trying to keep secrets and be like, Oh man, I'm never gonna, you know, like I'll never reveal that effect setting. Like I think that's total <laughs> BS. Like I, I think that actually strips agency away from you. It's like um, a, a great friend of mine said like, Hey, everybody has a keyboard, like all keyboard players that play a Nord have a Nord. Right. Oh, and, and I think it was actually Scott. I think it was Scott that said this. He was like, do they all sound the same? No. So to like keep secrets around, you know, your techniques or your pedal settings or your gear just is preposterous to me. First of all, who's to say anyone wants to sound like you any anyway? I mean, that that's a bit of a like an ego trip right away. <laughs> that's, like, that, oh, is, every, that is a bit every, arrogant, isn't it? Dude, it's insane. Yeah. Like everybody wants to sound like me. I mean, that's that's a tell. And then second off, like I find that when I post my stuff and I'm very forthcoming with stuff, it doesn't, people don't take it and copy it. They just feel like it maybe hopefully inspires them to dig into the stuff that they have, the effects or the techniques that they want to work on and use it in yeah. their way. And man, I mean, I get a lot out of that. My day gets made a lot when people tag me and say like, oh man, you know, I'm trying this thing and I'm putting it into this context. I find like, I find I get a lot of life out of that. Oh, I do too, man. I mean, just yeah. you saying, you know, the stuff that you're throwing up there inspires me to want to do mm -hmm. my thing. You're sort of dissecting all these different parts and, and um, explaining signal chains which by the way it helps me too because i just like plug things in and experiment and say oh Amazing. that's kind of cool. that's awesome let's try that yeah. <laughs> and you're actually yeah, dude, you're actually telling me <laughs> what i'm doing so i'm like oh, <laughs> oh okay i don't know though man. okay I, mean, I feel like you're 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 um your path might be more pure. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes live by these rules of like, all right, well, we're going to plug this in first and then it's going to come this. And, you know, and, and I sometimes will goof something up and then come up with something cool. They're like, wow. Uh, like, in fact, I'm going to release a, a 
a little video with all like MXR way huge stuff coming up that I, I stumbled on this thing of like running a fuzz into the into the 105Q wah and oh, then cool. a drive afterwards. And dude, like when you have fuzz wah drive, yeah. it gives this like animal primal thing about the uh, the wah. It brings it out of like synthy, just sort of like rock world into like, like guttural, like a Michael Bay Transformer movie sound or something. And it's <laughs> so sick. That sounds was, like something I'd be into, man. <laughs> I think you would, man. Yeah, totally. I, Totally. I, I discovered that by accident, you know, by breaking yeah. the rules. So, you know, I'm, so, I'm kind would of a, you, uh, w- yeah. Would you recommend that people experiment like that and just try oh, things? Yes, absolutely. I think that sometimes people are sort of stymied by, by the rules. Like, well, I know that these go in this order. I think if you flip stuff around, why not? I think it's, it's good though, to know about like, well, typically you'd want to put an octave pedal before a fuzz so that the fuzz doesn't garble what the octave pedal sees. I mean, I think there are some sort of like best practices uh-huh. that if you know, then you can choose to break them, you know, sort yeah. of like some basic theory stuff. If you know a little bit about about music theory, I think that's really good because then you can take that stuff and turn it and it it leads down less like roads of frustration. I think right. sometimes people just need a starting point. They're like, Absolutely. man, I don't even know where to start with this stuff. If I just plug stuff in randomly, I'm not going to get anything. They don't trust their ears yet. And so I think sometimes those rules help them develop their ear so that they can trust it so that then hopefully they do what you do and break the rules later. Yeah. Good advice, dude. I, I dig that too. I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, how did the um, whole Scott's Bass Lessons thing come about? Check it. I don't live in one of the big music towns. I mean, I think it's a big music town. Everybody from Minneapolis has this like chest beating, like Minneapolis is amazing. I mean, obviously Prince. Well, and Doesn't everybody <clears throat> though from their own t- hometown? Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. But I get um, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's not Nashville. It's not New York. It's not LA, right? So <clears throat> I had this idea. Uh, when I turned 40, I kind of went through this midlife crisis. <clears throat> I have a friend though, who says it was actually an awakening. It wasn't a midlife crisis. You it see, was an you see, and, all, yeah, it's dude. all in the words. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> in the word. and I, I like that. But basically the idea for me was my entire decade of my twenties was devoted to this rock band that then ended. And then the entire decade of my thirties was devoted to being a side man. And then when I turned 40, I wanted something of my own. I wanted to create a little bit of brand. I wanted to, you know, think about myself a little bit more entrepreneurial as mm-hmm. opposed to just sort of blowing in the wind. And so what I decided to do was just take social really seriously. I really started to take Instagram seriously. I started to post every day, doing stories, and I found that I really enjoyed it. Um, and so I, I preach this a lot. I think that if you can be yourself on social media, or if you can talk about something that you really like with real authenticity and you're good at it, good things will happen. If you're trying to bring an audience value and you're trying to make a community or build a community around you, I think it's really doable. And I remember my wife saying to me, I really love Scott. I loved Scott um, Divine before he even had the Academy, just when it was him and Marlo DK, dude, oh, wow. posting on YouTube. You remember Marlo? Yeah, yeah. Then I mean, he was, you know, like it was just Scott and Marlo and maybe Yannick, you know? And so I, I remember really loving Scott and I started to do the Instagram thing and my wife said, he's going to get in touch with you in a year. And I was like, that's preposterous. Nah. She's like, yeah, I bet he will. And we ended up doing, you know, like I tagged him in some stuff because I really, I really loved what he was doing. And then I took kind of like a week off of Instagram, not really like purposefully, but just, I just hadn't posted in a while. And he put this thing up. He'd been watching all the stories and like and posts. And he was like, where have you gone? He did this big story segment of like everybody at SBL, go follow this Ian Martin Allison guy because I don't want him to leave. And I woke up with like 600 new followers. And I was like, awesome. what is that? You know, I had like, I had like maybe a thousand followers. Like I almost doubled. My, I was like, what is happening? And then here's, here's what I did. I said to him in a DM, I said, I love what you do and I am good at X, Y, and Z. And if you need help with X, Y, or Z, I would be happy to do it for you period, like without even talking about money, whatever. I just love what you do. I'd love to bring you value. How can I make your life easier? And it all stemmed from that. 
he was like, wow, man, you know, well, well, would you want to do a course? Yes. And I did it and it went fine. And then he's like, great. Would you want to do a couple of seminars? You know? And, and of course, along the way, he never took advantage of me financially. He always paid me. He was, but I never made it about like, here, here's, here's what I'm going to charge. You know, uh, the, the money thing to me is less, I think it is the least valuable thing that you get from an interaction with someone like that or with a wonderful company. Mm -hmm. I think it's the least valuable thing you get. I think the relationship and cultivating that relationship is by far and away more valuable. So then when COVID hit, he was like, would you want to come on like part-time or maybe even full-time? And it just developed from that, man. So, you know, like when people ask me, like, how do I get in touch with companies or how do I get in touch with artists or whatever? I'm just like, figure out what they, what is going to make their life easier. They're just people, yeah. you know, like what can I take off of Scott's plate to make him be able to spend more time with Lisa and the kids? Right. Like that's actually what it is. It's not like, Oh, what six skills am I going it, to? It's more around like, how can I serve you the uh. best? And that, I think that mentality is just really missing. Um, in so many social media interactions, uh -huh. it's like, come to my show, buy my product, take my course um, versus, hey, can I can I give something to you? And I think if you're offering something, uh, it may lead to a more meaningful relationship that then will potentially lead to more money down the road. I think like money is um, it, it's a it's a secondary cause sort of, <laughs> like, yeah. I like to think about it that way. Right. It's, it's a, it's the reaction or uh -huh. it's the, you know, the, the thing at the end of the road versus the thing that I want to like be up front with and be like, well, here's the, here's what it is. You know, that's some really good insight. And so you, your wife and, and you basically threw that out into the universe, right? Yeah. You said, okay. And then you actually thought about it for a second reached out to this person, um, recognized what your strengths were yeah, and figured out what you may be able to possibly add to, to the brand or the that's company. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's how it worked out. And that, you know, that's a smart way to do it. It really yeah. is. And for people um, who are hoping to get a gig or hoping to get a job or hoping to get an endorsement or hoping to get anything really in life yeah get a friend hey <laughs> recognize what you yeah. actually want without <clears throat> being self-serving yeah and uh yeah that's awesome it's a it's a big deal it's a big game changer i mean i remember when i first got the eric hutchinson gig and i would you know i would like type emails out to companies like hey i'm gonna be in front of these many people per night and you want to send me some free stuff and it was just off like dude i like i like pull the sheets over my head at night with embarrassment about how I used to think about relationships in mm -hmm. the music industry. It was, it was embarrassing. Well, a lot of, a lot of times people just don't understand how it works and, yeah. and you want to, you want to go for the gusto right away. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? Like that's my moment. I, 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 this is what I want to say. This is what I want to say. I got to say it right now in four words. Right. And, and right. sometimes, sometimes, that is the way to go, but the majority of the time is probably not the way to go. <laughs> yeah, man. I have found so much more success with talking about the things that I actually like, tagging companies and social media posts that I love, that I genuinely love and use the stuff and, right. and, and treating people, whether it's artists or artist reps um, or, or luthiers, you know, anyone in these organizations, um, whether whether they're songwriters or someone that's sweeping the shop floor at a at a bass boutique, it's like the people, they all have the right. same. They right. all feel the same things that we all feel. And, yet, yes. you know, sometimes yes. we kind of, you know, at least I when I was younger, just sort of thought about um thought about it as like, oh, well, it, well, I need to say the right thing in the email and show the numbers. Yeah. And it's like, man, I've had so much more success talking about people's kids. Yeah. Well, you're, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all like, about relationship building. Yeah, dude. Instead it really, of really just, is. even though, you know, you're, you're thinking about the things that you need or the things that you want, yet you're forgetting that these are just people. 
you just know. people. Yeah. So. They have they have wants and needs too. Yeah. They have things that they want and the, the things that they need. Dude, I was just talking, I've got a great friend who does um who reps for Low Boy. They make like kick drum beaters. Okay. And and he's a great drummer and he just took this gig as like the artist rep. And I was like, tell me what tell me like can you think about the favorite people that you have on your roster and why? And he said, yes, it's two drummers. It's this person and this person. And it's not because I love their band or I love their drumming necessarily. It's because they treat me like a person. Like they don't, you know, they, they ask me about my wife. They ask me, you know, and even if they may, maybe don't care, they sure pretend like they do and they make an effort. And then it actually cultivates relationship versus like, Hey man, can you send this amount of beaters out to this gig? And, and man, like just hearing it from him and he's a smart, great dude, Nate Babs, man, Nate Babs, you're a beast. He's such a great drummer, such a great guy. And he was like, when people talk to me like I'm a human and not just a rep for the kick drum beater company, he's like, I want to bend over backwards for them. And, and anyway, that's kind of what I, I want to cultivate that in every aspect of my life. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that I do, but I want to cultivate that with my family. I want to cultivate that with SBL. I want to cultivate that with Dunlop, with the artists I work for, with every session that I do, I want those people to feel important and that their needs are being met and that I'm not like, oh, well, I'm here to just do my <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that, that that's what actually builds career um, is thinking about the people and the relationships and how best to serve those interactions. I think that's actually what builds career. 100%. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's all part of the evolution of trying to just be a good human being. Yes, yeah, that's, you know, that's it's well not said. only that's really business, true. it's, uh, you know, your personal life, every relationship, it's every person true. that you meet, you know, just being a good human. Yeah. All right. I love it all. Let's go on to tone and gear. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> how, how did you develop right. your tone, man? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's like, saying, how do you develop your speaking voice? I, I think like... Well, let me explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you start down here. Yeah. And then, um, I I uh, grew up loving the big attackers. Um, I grew up loving Getty Lee and um, Entwistle and Chris Squire and and uh, people that hit their bass really hard. But then I went I went the other direction and really fell in love with some players like Hubert Eves IV, who played on that Erica Badu live record. Mm-hmm. Fell in love with Michelle and Diggio Cello. Fell in love with some players that were less like distortion rock monsters maybe in in the more r&b space and um i found that when i started to do sessions if i played through the string and i wasn't smacking the string i found that for what i was doing i was getting better results by playing sort of softly so i play really soft i do a thing where i almost um, I'm letting my arm pull through, like my finger isn't getting the note. I'm letting sort of my arm, the weight of gravity, pulling my arm through the string, like tensioning the string and dropping it almost. Uh, I really think about that um, right hand approach as the foundation of what I do and how I sound. And that then uh is perfect for triggering synth pedals and for, you know, getting a really nice sound out of an octave pedal. Um, I really like muting. I do a lot of left hand muting. Um, and then I play with a pick a lot too. And that's what? the thing that I really enjoy. What, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my first teacher, Josh, my first teacher, what I think was a guitar player. And he was like, he said to me, okay, you're going to study with me. You're only going to play with the pick. And I said, okay. I was 13. I hadn't, you know, he, I was like, why? And he was like, I'll tell you why. Because finger players are blurry. That's what he told me. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay. Well, what about Getty and Billy yeah. Sheehan and <laughs> Josh Paul? And, <laughs> and it, you know, it's just so funny, man. But I, I really do feel, um, I also like to slap the bass. Uh, and so I think those three, those three things, like fingers, pick and and thumb stuff either like muted thumb back by the bridge or like traditional like slap double double thumb thing i do that thing where i go down and then up on the string uh-huh. i think those those three techniques are critical there i mean i find that i use i don't use the slapping as much as the other two but it's surprising sometimes especially in minneapolis somebody you know is like oh you're in minneapolis i want that funk thing you know do it with a pick and then send me a track of it like double thumb too yep. and so i don't know man i find that um 
I started out as a chameleon in session world, trying to really solve a lot of problems and hit a lot of targets. Uh Uh, And then um, I really have settled into really trying to be good at those three techniques and letting like a real clear attack um, and deliberate intentionality around my like right hand stroke, whether it's soft and through the string or whether it's pick or whether it's thumb, letting those things uh, really drive uh, what I'm doing. And then hopefully that comes through in pedals. Uh, but, but I really think, I think a lot about right hand in terms of my sound. Uh-huh. I think it, right hand more so than I think about uh, the kind of bass or the, or the kind of strings or the, or the kind of pedal. I think it, it all, it, you know, my friend says it's bone tone. You know, bone it comes tone. from your, yeah, I like yeah, that. You know, I like it that. comes, it comes from your muscles and your sinew and your, yeah. you know, your bones. Um, then of course there's gear, but, but yeah, I, right hand for me is a big, big part of it. That's where you're starting. That's where the yeah. tone is actually originating for with sure your, with your right hand. Cool. Yep. Very cool. Uh, what about, gear now now that you have your <laughs> your your tone originating from the bone uh yeah. where, where where do you go next man oh dude i mean how long how long you got how long okay. is this podcast okay. All right. dude let's start with I strings mean, <laughs> what kind of strings do you use and, well, man, and why are you I, using I, I really i mean when i found super brights um i really fell in love and i found those before i was starting to do some work for dunlop so rounds i play almost all super brights although it's funny like i have basses that have i have a bunch of bass guitars Mm -hmm. and so some of them have stuff on them that are like oh these sacred strings that i don't even know what they are you know and i don't want to change them because it's got a certain vibe but if i'm changing strings i'm typically going a pretty light gauge of nickel super brights for rounds. And then the Dunlop flats, I love too. I think though that there are tons, there's more variation in flats than in rounds for me. So like I have basses that have TIs. I have the Fender 9050 flats, I think are a really nice string, really underrated. The Dunlop flats are so cool. The Dunlop sound to me kind of almost like a black nylon, um, but that is that is a little, but with a little more like punch and steel string vibe, but there's this supple, really beautiful top end to the Dunlop flats that I love. So I've got those on a bunch of bases. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I kind of, I, I kind of try different strings, either flats or rounds and maybe a couple of different brands, especially in terms of flats on stuff until I find the right thing. Strings are really important to me. Um, And then when I find the right set and the right gauge for the bass, I typically kind of like, okay, that that is that bass now forever is going to wear, you know, super brights 45 to 105. Whereas, whereas the T-Bird is going to wear super brights 40 to 100 because I like the tension on that. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. real, I'm real persnickety and precious about that. Crap. Okay. Well, here's a question. How, how do you know when it's not the right string for that particular bass? To me, it, it's, it's almost less about the tone and more about the feel like, um, you know, like, man, like b- before we jumped on, we were talking to Daryl, you know, from Dunlop. And he was like, oh, man, you know, I've got these different strings on this bass. And they just feel like, like, uh, you know, like high tension wires, like telephone cables. And I know that thing, like it's got to feel right. Mm-hmm. So if you get used to a certain gauge and a certain core, like a hex core versus a round core and the way that kind of like responds on the particular instrument, I think it's a feel thing. And that just, it, dude, I mean, I don't know, you know, it's like just trial and error from. Yeah from so much time what, what do you use what are what are your strings du jour I, I i like the super brights man i've been using yeah. i love the i i do agree uh with the flats the dunlop flats the punch is my favorite yeah part about them pretty um, great but yeah i just they feel right they sound great they bite enough yep. that and i love i love the bite yeah you do <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, so, so for people that might uh, just be starting to play bass and they're getting their first bass, maybe starting out one dimensional in their playing, right? They want to be Robert Trujillo in Metallica. So yeah. for a rock bass, yeah, what strings should they get? Oh, I mean, it'd be hard for me to recommend anything other than Dunlop. I, I don't know in that early stage 
if it matters too much, I think it's more about just getting your hands on the instrument over and over and over again. And if you've got the money, change them. Um, and I, I do think that Dunlops are a great value, actually. I mean, I know here sure. we are on the, the Dunlop podcast, but but I, I do think that they're a great value. I mean, but I, as a kid, man, when I couldn't afford it, I would just boil. Me too. Did you do that? Yeah, Me dude. Too. That's the best. I had a string. Dude, I still have it. I have my string pot that I used specifically for boiling, like not for food. This isn't the soup, you know, <laughs> like pot. Oh, <laughs> this soup <laughs> tastes kind of weird. Which pot yeah, did you use? Yeah. It's like tastes like finger funk. Um, yeah, man. I, I used to boil my strings all the time. I, what, as a kid, I really like them to sound bright. So, you know, it just depends on what you're after, but yeah. Okay. So in the case of a rock tone thing, I think, um, I think nickel strings feel really good. Stainless might be a touch brighter, but they feel a little grittier on my fingers. That's just me, but I think get a nice bright nickel round. And then when they die, boil them up, boil them up a few times. It's all good. Yeah. And then when, and then when, you know, they're getting too funky, gr grab a new set. Um, yeah. But I mean, yeah, hard to go wrong with the Dunlops for yeah. sure. Uh, actually, Robert has a signature set. Dunlop. Oh, for real? Robert Trujillo yeah. set. Yeah. I, so I haven't, I haven't ever tried those, but I bet they're dope. But I did just throw out a name, you know, for a huge monster <laughs> rock bass player. But yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? You know, of somebody yeah. who just wants to play some rock and roll, you know, yeah. What do, what do I we mean, get? And, and just try stuff. Like I think too, people get so set in their ways and myself included. I think try different stuff. See, check out different brands, check out different gauges, see what's going to work for you the best. I mean, that's the, you know, I mean, strings are like jeans. There's not like a one size fits all, you know, and people like will, will find different things they like about different gauges. And, and I'm real. I mean, the string next to, next to my hands, the string is the next thing you really interface with in terms of your sound. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think getting the strings right and kind of having, oh, being able to compare, oh, I like this aspect of nickel as opposed to steel. So you got, that just means you got to try stuff and it's sort of a long, expensive road, but boil them up. That, that's the yes. hot tip, man. That's that, that, is, that's that budget that is, hot tip. And it works. It definitely <laughs> <It does>. works. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I know you have, uh, you mentioned earlier, you have a ton of bases and that is awesome. What's your go-to? Dude, I, um, there are, there are Wait, so many that I really you love. You have a signature I, base, right? Yeah, I do. I, I have it, I have it here. Although I know you guys don't do the video, right? No, but well, we can, uh, we can use our words to describe it <laughs> and people can um, use their imaginations. Yeah, man. I, this, <laughs> this guy, Saku Viore from uh, Finland built me this incredible instrument. It, um, the company's called Voren Saku. And you roll that R a little bit, Voren Saku. But if I try too hard, I sound like a jerk. So I'm not going to try too hard. Okay. <laughs> but this is a this is a short scale bass, kind of combining. Um, it's the Ian Martin Allison signature, which I've just sort of now been able to say with like a straight face without being like, "What is this real life?" Uh, <laughs> but it's so cool. It's kind of um, a cross between two styles of instrument I love. It's sort of like a jazz bass meets bass six. And I okay. love the Fender bass six. Um, I do a lot of sort of like baritone stuff, um, like duo singer songwriter stuff on just like a, a bass with like spring reverb and trem. And I have a bass six that I love. Uh, and we kind of tried to marry those two things. I love a jazz bass and I love a bass six. So we kind of did this offset and it's, it's just, it's so beautiful. Um, the instruments that he makes, it's, they're just incredible. Um, and he'll make it out of whatever you want and he'll, you know, do the custom neck specs, however you want. It's the most customizable. I mean, even more so than maybe the Fender custom shop, every single detail you can really tweak down to the radius. This is a compound radius on this base 7.25 that flattens out as you get higher so that if you're bending or if you like lower action, you still have that beautiful, gorgeous, chewy, vintage round thing happening down low. But then nice. as you go up high, it flattens out. So the action's a little better and you can bend um, if that's important to you. And it is for me. Yeah. Right. So um, this, this is a huge this so, was a, an incredible blessing. I, I love this like instrument. It, it sort of looks like a Jaguar 
a yeah, little bit. Yeah, like you know, like a base six just looks like a giant jag. Yeah. Essentially. What and are the so sw- what do the switches do on there? There's switches yeah, on so, this base. Yep. It's it's uh it's pickup switches just like on an offset like a okay. like a jazz master or a base yeah. six. It's pick up on and off and then series parallel. Nice. Um, so it can sound like kind of like a traditional jazz bass, but then when you flip them, I believe into series um, or maybe it's parallel. I always get those two mixed up, but it's got the jazz bass configuration and then it's got sort of like the, it puts, uh, it runs both of them, I guess in parallel and that, and that makes it sort of like a humbucker, kind of a bigger, almost more like P bass sound. Um, Very and cool. it's, it's just, it's just really, really. Is wonderful. that for sale? Can people check that out or is people it... can? Yeah, okay. you can buy one. Um, they're on reverb. He's got, he's got one up on reverb at the moment and, but it's all custom order. So if you buy one, then he wants, then it's the beginning of the conversation around like what you want. Very um, cool. But, but this is a really fun feature set to jump off with. So if anybody wants to check out the Ian Martin Allison SIG, you don't have to do everything. Like it, it's not like a, well, now you're just going to get this exact thing. I mean, it's a, it's a really fun platform to jump off and maybe customize some of the, you know, the neck specs or, or, um, even the frets. He does like stainless steel frets that are so beautiful. Um, that is a beautiful so, base. Yeah, it, it's great. But I think like, um, honestly, like desert Island for me is I have a 78, uh, Antigua jazz base that, that is just, it's incredible. Do you know that color? It's kind of like fades from like cream into almost like gray green Uh, on the outside. Okay. And I, I love it. I love the color so much. It reminds me of like my grandparents appliances you know, like that they had in the sixties, you know, like when everybody had like avocado green yeah. stuff in their kitchen, yep. it's such a vibe. And whenever people are like, man, I hate that color. I immediately, I'm like, Ooh, I, I don't trust you now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like I feel very strongly, you know, like very, and, and it's a very contentious color. Like it's not, not everyone likes it, which uh-huh. means that I don't trust all those people, I guess. No, <laughs> there are so kidding. many. There are so many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I, I bought this instrument 78, same year that I was born. Um, I bought this instrument and that's, it's the jazz bass that I learned how to hear a jazz bass on, you know, like, I don't know if you had a, a ray, like a stingray when you were younger, where you're like, oh, it was your first one. And you kind of like bonded with that and learned how to hear a stingray. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, what was it? I, it was It was a uh, 1978. Stingray Sick, that my dude. that my cousin who was you know he was he started me off right um he was a bassist great bassist who yeah. played around all over LA all the time for all the for years and years and years and years and he's quite a bit older than I am but he I didn't have a bass so he loaned me his 78 music man bass and um I kept that thing I think for 25 years and then he Dude, finally asked it, it back, oh, asked man. for it back. And oh. uh, <laughs> I was like, um, I don't, I don't know where it is. Uh, <laughs> Johnny, I'm sorry. <laughs> what color? What color? It was, it was, um, cause he had it forever. So it was this like silver mirror type thing, but it was I so worn in. There were these, um, spots you know where he was resting his thumb on the pickup that was just worn out and just dug in so it was all beat up but it sounded so punchy i mean that thing would really just you hit one note and it really punched you in the mouth it was awesome amazing amazing i have a 79 stingray that i don't play enough it's sunburst but it's they're so they're so cool and yeah man the first one the first one of like a thumbprint bass like that a j a p a, a ray you know it's something that you know you kind of like that sort of sets you off on this on this course right yeah and i mean my my antigua jazz bass 78 not not a particularly great year or, or in terms of like you know fender cannon right, right. but that bass and it's heavy and it has neck pocket gaps and the pickups are kind of weak and microphonic and i've tried to beat it 20 times times with other uh bet better quote unquote years custom shop all that stuff and i always come back to it like on paper it's the worst base i have <laughs> but like in hand you yeah. know it's maybe like the best it feels it's right so strange yeah dude yeah. and so i mean anybody out there that's on the search for the holy grail just know this the search is fun but it doesn't exist there's no holy grail the best base is the one that you play or that you're playing like right now right then yeah i actually yeah. have um um i bought a squire 
jazz bass. And I, I needed a white bass for a video shoot for something Sick. I did with one yes. of my buddies, an EP that we did. And it was kind of an old school type thing. And I just went to Guitar Center real quick, bought this bass for 185 bucks. Yeah. And that bass, I've used that on so many sessions for real? That's so because awesome. it just feels so good. And it has this really sort of clanky, unique sound. But I mean, it doesn't <laughs> matter how much it costs. If it works, it works. That's so true. And don't you think it's about the time spent with it? Like it's about the time spent getting to know that instrument, you know? And I, I really think that that's so cool. Like Marcus was saying this, Marcus Miller was saying the thing of like commit to an instrument, like get an instrument, commit to it because it's going to be that commitment that's going to like, people are going to see you with that thing over and over again. It's going to kind of create brand. I mean, when you think Marcus, you think that late seventies jazz, right. you know, right. like that's the vibe. And oh man, I just wish, like I hear that and it's so compelling to me. And yet I am such like a base, I'm just like a base trader. I'm constantly, <laughs> you know, like trying different stuff and checking it all out. And, um, but I really, uh, I really that, do try to spend time with, if I get a new one in the stable, I really try to play it for a long time and really get to know it yeah. so that I kind of know like what it does and what it's for. Um, but I, I really like thumbprints, like, like I want a bass. I want the Hofner because it sounds like a Hofner and it sounds mm -hmm. like Maca, you know, it, with the Beatles. And I want a Rickenbacker because it's going to do that, uh, Maca neck pickup thing, but then it's going to do that Chris Squire bridge pickup thing. And I want a bird because, you know, it's going to have that end twistle vibe from that certain period. And I, so, so I kind of have this weird compartmentalization when I buy an instrument, it, I almost kind of consider it a character. I'm like, okay. Ooh, okay. I'm going to set you up to play this part on a right. session when I need that, you know? Um, even though, you know, there's stuff that I gravitate toward. That's how I see instruments as like players uh, in the movie or they're, they're like actors that, you know, they're like character actors. Yeah. They're very thumbprint. They have a personality and I'm going to use them for the thing when the time is right on a session, you know, tools. Yeah, tools, man. tools, tools. Yeah, man. but but sometimes when I say tools, I, I I feel like it's almost sort of too reductive. It's like it's not so much like a hammer or like, oh, I'm just gonna select the right drill bit. I do really think of them as personalities. Like I, I see, I don't know about you, but like when I'm doing a session, I really see sections of a song as scenes of a movie. I, I actually see it. Like when I when I am thinking, I don't have synesthesia like uh seeing colors in music, but I do I, like imagery comes up for me where it's like it's a scene of the movie where it's like just dusk at the lake, but it's a little too cold to be out with a jacket or without a jacket. Like, you know, like I get that stuff. I don't know if that sounds weird, but that is just how I think. Okay. <laughs> and so so then like to me, fitting an instrument or a pedal or something into that scene becomes easier if I kind of have the characters in my arsenal, the actors set up, you know, like I, I'm the director and I'm going to choose the P base for this scene because it's the, it's the, the character that's going to get the job done the best. I don't know. I like to think about it that way versus like, ah, you know, here's the hammer. That's the, that's the right size for the nail. It's a little more like whimsical and arty, pretty nerdy, but it's true for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's nerdy at all. I think it's cool. It's so nerdy. Dude. It's really cool, man. You're, you're, you're casting. Yeah. 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 I yeah. think so. I, yeah. I really do think about it that way. Yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, what about amps? Amps, I actually don't care that much about amps. I have a few things, like I've got an old SVT that I love. I've got an old B15. I have a Noble head that's incredible. I have some Trickfish stuff that's really cool. Um, I have a bunch of stuff, but I find that I don't, like I'm never recording through it anymore because I have like a, a pedal chain um, and some Neve Pre's that I really love that I, I find that I'm going direct more than anything and then using amp sims if I need to. Um, I tell like when people ask me about amps, it's it's an unsatisfying answer. But this is what I say, like the best amp, the best, most holy grail, incredible amp rig setup in a crappy room with a crappy band will be crappy <laughs> <laughs> and and the crappiest amp in an incredible room with incredible front of house and an incredible uh, band around you will be the best amp. 
Mm. So I think sometimes with amplifiers, like I think a room is so much more important to the sound of your instrument or like a PA or like how your front of house puts your bass in the mains is so much more important than the amplifier you have on stage. Um, so I really have tried these last few years to endeavor to play with better bands, play in better rooms and play with better sound personnel and think about that more than what amp can I get? Because that will never solve the problem of like a bad room. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. But it's unsatisfying. It's unsatisfying. I mean, Ampeg for old school, Trickfish for modern and Noble. Uh, I love that stuff a lot. Very cool. Um, let's talk about your signal chains. Effects let's and go, dude. I'll talk go. about it all day. What do you want to know? Oh, just throw it, throw it at me. When you plug <laughs> it, when you sit down, yeah, and you plug in your bass, yeah, and whether you're going to record a rock track or a, a funk thing, tell me how you're doing it. Yeah, dude, I always compress. Um, first, always. There's a compressor on in my signal chain, always, unless I'm just plugging into an amp and, you know, I'm just checking something out. But if yeah. I'm doing it with any kind of intention around recording or around gigging, I uh, have an Origin um, Cali 76, like a big box one with a transformer in it that I love. I don't know that it's better than all the other compressors. It's just the one that I got used to. Again, that imprinting thing. It's like the one that I kind of learned how to hear compression with. I've had it for a lot of years. It's killer and it's sort of like my binky like i don't you know like you have kids like they don't want to you know they don't want to yeah. go to bed without the animal or yeah. it, that's sort of how that box yeah. is for me i do find really... it kind of weird that you go to bed with your compressor but <laughs> 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 otherwise dude, everything's <laughs> totally normal bro <laughs> dude i mean yeah it, sometimes you know I fall asleep with the bass on me like my yeah. wife will come in and be like are you serious <laughs> dude <laughs> That's awesome, uh, man. Yeah, but I, I compress a lot. And my thing is I parallel compress. So I'm running a clean, uh, you know, a dry signal that is as hot as the compressed signal. I compress pretty hard on the compression side and I run a dry signal. And I just find that with the way that my right hand engine works, it's uh, I feel like the nuance kind of comes up, limits my peaks a little bit. And then as a result of that peak limiting, I'm able to turn that signal up and everything just sounds a little more gushy, you know, kind of like when you master a track, you know, it's like, it's not making it louder necessarily. It's just pulling the peaks down so that the valleys can kind of come up and you hear that, you know, that kind of that nuance in the verse, you know, I, I think about compression that way. Um, so I compress always first. And then I go into an octave pedal um, made by Three Leaf that I love. But there's a ton of octave pedals. That's just the one on my board. Um, I've I've used the MXR stuff over the years. I've used DBS. I've used Boss. Um, and then I run into this low gain fuzz that Three Leaf also makes. Um, and then I run into a Swiss Army knife, uh, the Line 6 HX Stomp. And then out of the back of the stomp or the side of the stomp, I'm plugging in stuff constantly. If I need like a wah, I love the the big um, 105Q, the Dunlop, the white, the 105Q. I love it. And I mean, the new the new Jason Chancellor. Whoa, dude, that Ooh, just came Justin. out. Justin. Yeah. So, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm so yeah. sorry. Yes, no, Justin that, yes. Chancellor. That, yeah, I, man. I have that and I, I just included it out with me on tour and uh, that thing is amazing it's so amazing. sick yeah i'm i'm really excited to figure out how to like integrate that into my rig but off the off the side of that hx stomp you know you can interface stuff into it so i don't have to rearrange my board i can build a little sideboard or just have a couple of things off to the side um and so yeah man it's pretty simple compression so my whole my whole thing is compression then any kind of pitch effect then any kind of fuzz then any sort of multi-effect maybe if there's um delay or modulation or verb. Uh, and then out of that, I run into that noble DI and oh, cool. Jack and I go way back, man. Um, Jack Roan, who builds that noble DI, he came to a gig of mine in 2015 and brought me the first version with the tubes poking out of it, dude. Oh, wow. Tubes and the transformer wrapped in electrical tape. And, and I know a lot of, a lot of bass players had some input on that, but, um, I was one of them and I, I felt real fortunate to get to kind of help him dream up that second version that he stuck with for so long. It's a very, I, very cool box. It's a I cool have rectangle. Been, I've been wanting to get one of those. Actually. Oh, do so, it, do yeah, it. They're so I gotta, cool. I got to get one. Yeah, you could, you do. They're great. Very cool, man. Man, I appreciate you coming on here and sharing your 
vast wealth of knowledge, man. It's Dude, so, you kidding so me? cool. Are you kidding me? I, I, this has been my pleasure every second of it, man. Thank you very much for having me. What would you say to uh, bassists or, or musicians, really, who are trying to build their brand, build it up, you know, for themselves so they can get out into the world? Obviously, you know, you want to build your tools and, and have your you're playing on point but to because you've done such a great job um with your socials and online you know building a presence so so how do people do it how would you recommend that a young young player does it my first gut reaction to that is to talk about well you need to build your social media and make sure you're on tiktok because that's going to be next and you know when instagram fades like facebook but i'm not going to say that because i think that it, it's too obvious and sometimes i think it's too overwhelming um, and to your point, you obviously have to have your skills in place. So I'm glad you said that. The thing that I want to say that I think is actually very tangible and everyone listening to this could do it now at five minutes after you're done with this podcast, you could do this thing that, that I'm going to tell you. And uh, short of it being like a like a corny, like, hey, it's an action step. Here, here's what I think everyone can do and everyone should do. Um, if you're a creative person, maybe you're recording some things on your phone or in your DAW, you have a little idea on your bass or on your instrument and you've put it into your voice memos. I mean, do you do that? I do. Like, yeah, I feel yeah. like so many people do that. I do that. I have hunt. I was about to say thousands. That's a stretch. Ian. <laughs> uh, hundreds, but hundreds for sure of ideas in the voice memos in my phone. And when I do one, I think to myself, Hey, ha, huh, I've been creative. And then there it sits dude. And, and you and I know that I don't have any music out and, and there it sits. And then it, is it meaningful? I don't know. It, it just sits on your phone. Here's what you should do right now. Get done with this podcast. Make sure you finish up all the way to the last second. So that algorithm prioritizes the podcast. But then after you're done with the last second of the podcast, go into your phone and find something that you think is good not some stuff that's the B-rate stuff, but the good stuff, the the gunner, the winner, the one that you've named. And it doesn't just say like audio recording 37. You named it something. And I want you to listen to it. And then I want you to conjure in your mind, who does it remind you of in your friend circle or in um, a circle maybe that you run with? And, and think about could you send it to someone as a springing off point for an idea to do a collaboration, to build a song, to do something? So you're not sitting around waiting for that DM, waiting for the phone to ring. No phones ring anymore. You're not waiting for the text or the email. You actually are going to create now some opportunity or work for yourself, for something that you created that you are going to give to a friend or a potential collaborator that is a gift and it has no strings attached. Here's the most important point. It can't be, hey man, let's collab and and let's, uh, and hey, what's your schedule like? This is what you say. I was going through my phone and I found this thing and it reminded me of you. Mm. I hope it, I hope it sparks some creativity for you today, period. And then you send it. And I have found that when I have done that, it always leads to something. I do that a lot, actually. I send people music, just little bits and say like, hey, do you, is this cool? Is this stupid? Most of the time, it's so unexpected and someone gets it and they go like, whoa, th this is cool. And then they maybe drop what they're doing and maybe write a little something and send it right back. Maybe, maybe they don't. But oftentimes I feel like because of the lack of expectation, there is this real... Um, like surprise and delight that happens as a result. And it always leads to something, whether it's a big song, ah, I don't know, but maybe it's a coffee, maybe it's a hang, maybe it's a gig. You know, I did that just case in point. I um, did that with a, a slap thing that I wrote that I wasn't going to do anything with. And I sent it to Corey Wong. Now, this is before Corey was an international superstar. He was on his way. The meteoric rise was at the beginning. And I sent it to him and I was like, dude, it just, just sort of reminds me of you. I don't know. And he hit me back right away. He's like, what are you doing tomorrow? He's like, you want to get together and, and write it? And I'm like, yes. And I went over to his house. We wrote this tune. Um, then we went and had Chipotle and I went home and he put it on his first record. It's called That's My Passport Photo. It's the last track on Corey Wong and the Green Screen Band. And so I'm just saying like, that's something that you can do right now. 
Um, and I, and the Corey Wong example, I mean, that's, you know, that's maybe a, a bit of a needle in the haystack, but, but at the time Corey wasn't famous. He was right. my friend. Right. <laughs> so send something today to your friend that you believe in. That, Kill- that's my advice. That is killer advice. And Thank you, you know what? You, you, no matter who it is, you took that step. You took that initiative. Yes, dude. To make something happen. Yes, 100%. And it all, and if nothing else, it just leads to vibes. It leads to good vibes. It leads to goodwill. It leads to good feelings. Even if it, you know, you don't get together and write the next, you know, banger. Yeah. Um, it leads, like people like it. People are appreciative. No one is going to be like, oh, that's dumb. The, in fact, dude, they're going to see the stuff that you can't see in it because it was a gift and because it was, it is without expectation. Mm-hmm. They are going to go over and above to see the best in it. And it's going to make the whole process even better. So when they return to you and they have a little something and they wrote a little lyric or, or, a, or a melody or something over the top of it, you're off to the races. Amazing, dude. I love it. I Thank love you, your insight. You got to, you got to, <laughs> man, I, I really do. I really do. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thank you, you very that's, much. That's really good advice. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing it. Dude, it's my, it is my honor, man. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much again. That is our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Stay healthy, please, and stay kind. Spread love, good vibes, and inspiration. And remember, do not be scared. Don't be scared. You got this. Follow your path and just play. I'm Josh Paul. I hope to see you all out there sometime soon. And thank you to Dunlop for making this show possible. And be sure to check out Bass Freaks wherever you get your podcasts. Cheers. Cheers.